Hello and welcome to the Emmanuel Croydon podcast. At Emmanuel Croydon, we exist to be a community drawn together by our desire to know and follow Jesus. We long to become disciples of Jesus who are equipped to serve him in the whole of life, transforming families, communities and workplaces as we love God with heart, mind, soul and strength. We hope you enjoy this week's talk from the morning services. Thank you for joining us today. Grace and peace to you. Hello. We're in a sermon series looking at writings that relate to the Jewish exile in Babylon in the 6th century BC, the lowest point in Old Testament Jewish history. And we're considering what they have to say to us as we experience extraordinary disruption to our lives and radical changes in the way we're able to relate to one another within our society. The exile of the Jewish people to Babylon took place in three phases over a period of about 20 years. It began in 605 BC, the year Nebuchadnezzar became king of Babylon. Daniel and his friends, whose story we looked at in two sermons earlier in this series, were among the first group of exiles taken at that time. Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem again about eight years later, in 598 to 97 BC. The 18-year-old King Jehoiakim was taken captive and deported to Babylon, along with all the leading people of the community. About 10,000 officers, fighting men, craftsmen, and artisans. All the elaborate golden treasures that were used in the temple were stolen, removed, and taken to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar appointed Jehoiakim's 21 year old uncle, Zedekiah, to be king of Judah and left him behind to head a vassal state. About 10 years later, Zedekiah himself rebelled. This led to the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar's forces. Solomon's temple was burned to the ground, along with all the principal buildings of the city, and the city walls were destroyed. Zedekiah was forced to watch the execution of his two sons, then blinded and himself taken into captivity in Babylon along with most of the remaining Jewish population. A remnant of the poorest people were left behind to work the land. The exile continued for a further 50 years or so before the Jews were allowed to begin returning and begin rebuilding Jerusalem. The return also took place in stages spread over about 20 years. Today, we're going to hear an extract from a letter that the prophet Jeremiah wrote from Jerusalem to the captives in Babylon, sometime between the second and third of those sieges. It's a letter they received, therefore, a few years into their period of captivity. You might like at this point to pause the recording and get a Bible so that you can follow the reading and have it in front of you as I speak about it. My wife is going to bring the reading to us. The reading is taken from Jeremiah chapter 29, starting at verse 1. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jerichoam and the Queen Mother, the court officials and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to two men and sent it to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It said, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters 
Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number, therefore, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Thank you, Yeritza. Jeremiah had been an unpopular figure in Judah during the years leading up to the exile. He had consistently criticized its leaders for their idolatry and evil ways. He had warned of the threat from Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and the destruction that would leave Judah as a desolate wasteland. Successive kings, priests, officials, and their advisers had ignored him, threatened him, and at times arrested him and imprisoned him, or kept him in custody in a courtyard in the royal palace. They didn't like his message of impending disaster. I can't help wondering whether Jeremiah was a bit like Private Fraser in Dad's army. We're all doomed! Even after two waves of exiles had been deported to Babylon, as Judah was eking out its survival as a vassal state, there were prophets who insisted on giving false hope by peddling fake news. One such was Hananiah. He's mentioned in chapter 28. He tweeted that within two years Babylon would lose its power, all the exiles would be home, and the temple would be restored with all its treasures returned. Well, he didn't actually tweet, and his message was slightly more than 140 characters. Jeremiah spoke out against this false hope, condemning Hananiah as a false prophet. As it happened, within two months Hananiah was dead, so he didn't see to live he didn't live to see what actually happened it's possible that the letter jeremiah wrote which comes in the next chapter was intended to correct the false message that hananiah had given it is not a message of unmitigated disaster but a message that balances hope with realism the letter is in three parts it explores what their attitude should be to the place of captivity, how the exiles should respond to peddlers of fake news, and what God was really saying to them about their future. So let's look at what he says in a bit more detail. Verses 4 to 7 address the exiles' attitude to Babylon. With their own country all but destroyed, carried away from their homes and separated from their precious temple, which they saw as the home of God and the only place in which they could truly worship him, it would have been very easy for the exiles to slip into deep despair, into what John Bunyan in Pilgrim's Progress calls the Slough of Despond. They must have been tempted to think that life was no longer worth living, to give up hope. 
One can imagine them being reluctant to bring new children into the world in the middle of such an ordeal. One can imagine that if they had any energy and enterprise at all, it would be directed into a resistance movement of some sort, plotting to bring Babylon down, to destroy the enemy city, to get their own back, to win their freedom. Through Jeremiah, God tells them to do exactly the opposite to settle in Babylon and make a life for themselves. He tells them to think in the longer term. He tells them to build houses. You don't do that if you think you're going to leave soon. He tells them to plant gardens and crops. You don't do that unless you expect to be there to harvest the fruits of your labor. He tells them not to be reluctant to bring new children into the world, but on the contrary, to marry and have children and encourage their children to marry so that their community will expand, not dwindle away. Children and grandchildren are an investment in the future. He tells them to seek the peace and prosperity of Babylon not its destruction, because if the city that they live in prospers, then their lives will improve too. And as part of that, they are told to pray for the city. These last two instructions taken together must have been the most startling part of Jeremiah's letter when it was read by the exiles. It was an unprecedented thing to suggest in the ancient world, praying for one's enemies. Surely there is here a precursor of Jesus' radical teaching to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Verses 8 to 9 address the exile's attitude to false prophets. Jeremiah warns them not to believe or pay any attention to false prophets and fortune tellers who tell them just what they want to hear. It's easy for someone who wants to be popular to give a message of false hope. They, they need to discern what God is saying to them in the circumstances they are facing, not what others claim that God is saying. Which brings us to the third part of the letter, which we find in verses four, uh, 10 to 14, what God was saying to them about their future. They might have thought that their situation would never come to an end, that their nation was forever destroyed, and with it all the promises that God had given to their ancestors had come to nothing. But Jeremiah sees a bigger picture. He is honest about the disaster that has befallen them, and is able to give them a message of hope tempered by reality. An end to the exile is in sight, but not yet. The first exiles have already been in Babylon for nearly 20 years, others for up to 10 years, and Jeremiah prophes prophesies that their exile will continue for some considerable time yet, until 70 years have been completed. Then, he says, God promises to bring them back. A prophecy that was fulfilled in 538 BC when Babylon was defeated by the Persians and King Cyrus proclaimed their liberation. Secondly, he tells them that God has plans for them. Plans not to bring them to harm, but to see them prosper and thrive. Plans that will give them a hope and a future. For those who survived the exile and for their descendants, that future hope was built in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah when they returned to their own land to rebuild their nation. Thirdly, Jeremiah tells them that if they pray, God will listen. And if they seek God with all their heart, they will find him. Before we move on, I don't think I can ignore the way these momentous events are described in the Old Testament. 
Jeremiah addresses his readers, and we see it in verse 4, as those that God carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. In common with other Old Testament writers, he interprets the disasters that befall the nation as God's action to punish them. Before the exile began, Jeremiah saw Nebuchadnezzar as God's instrument to punish them if they did not change their ways and turn from evil. And similarly, here in the letter to the exiles, he writes in verse 14 that God is saying, I will gather you from the nations and places where I have banished you and will bring you back to the place to which I carried you into exile. I think it's an open question whether Jeremiah was correct to interpret the exile as having been instigated by God. It is beyond the scope of this reflection to inquire into whether God brought about these historical events or whether he simply used the actions of these two kings, Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus, two kings of the ancient world, to teach his people a lesson. How we answer that question depends on our attitude to scripture and its interpretation. But we can't pick and choose. If we say that we believe God prompted Cyrus to liberate the exiles, we can hardly deny that God prompted Nebuchadnezzar to take them captive in the first place. I mention this because I recently took part in a Zoom conference with an Egyptian pastor whose ministry is supported by Emmanuel through our Global Mission Committee. One of the striking things he shared with us was that he has an important role there in helping Egyptian Christians to understand that the coronavirus is not sent by God and is not a punishment for sin. I don't think in this country that I've heard anyone suggesting that it is. Now that brings me to ask what God might have to say to us through Jeremiah's letter. The first thing to point out is that there are very big differences between the social disruption that we are currently experiencing and the situation of the exiles in Babylon. Their enemy was a foreign king and his army. Ours is an invisible virus. They were taken captive and removed far from their homes and homeland for up to 70 years. We were confined to our homes for 10 weeks. For some of us, it will be longer. And we are confined to our homeland for a while now, unless we're prepared to be quarantined on our return. But not even the most pessimistic commentator suggests that this will go on for 70 years. Whereas they lamented, as we read in Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remembered Zion, we might be more inclined to say, by the banks of the A23 we sat and wept when we remembered exotic holiday destinations. They asked in the same psalm, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? Well, with streamed services on YouTube and prayer gatherings on Zoom, we don't even have to ask, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while confined to home or to our own land? In short, any suffering we experience in this pandemic is as nothing compared with the ordeal faced by the exiles. Having said that, I am aware of the heartbreaking grief of people who have been bereaved during lockdown. Some TV interviews have moved me to tears. These people have had to walk without the company of other people through the valley of the shadow of death. We have been walking together through the valley of the shadow of 40,000 deaths. I don't want to underestimate the effect that isolation has had on mental health for many people, or the impact that coronavirus has had on the jobs, incomes, and well-being of many people. 
I appreciate that in the midst of this disruption, it may seem to many as if there is no end in sight and no hope for the future. So let me pick out five thoughts that Jeremiah's letter has brought to my mind and share them with you for reflection. And the first is this, we should pray and work for the peace and prosperity of our own city and our own land, and of course, of the whole world. If the captives in Babylon were to pray for and seek the best for the enemy city where they were held captive, how much more should we pray for our city and our land? Our economy, along with economies all over the world, has been devastated. It will take a long time and require hard work and ingenuity for it to recover. We shouldn't think of prosperity in mere financial terms, but more broadly in terms of well-being. Maybe lockdown is teaching us how to live with less consumption and less stimulus. We should aim not to return to where we were, but to move forwards to a new and better reality, a new social and economic order in a greener and more sustainable world, a less unequal society in which health and care workers and other key workers are genuinely appreciated and properly rewarded and in which the migrant workers on whom we depend are made to feel more welcome and valued than they have been in recent years. Coronavirus has been a great equaliser. It affects the weak, the poor and ethnic minorities disproportionately. But politicians and royalty have also been vulnerable to it. It took a virus-related health threat to prompt councils in this country to find places to get rough sleepers off the streets. Let us hope and pray for the day to come when we don't need to run a homeless shelter during the winter months. And of course, our prayers and longing for a less unequal society should not end at the borders of our own country. It is something we should long for in every country, and at the moment it needs to be our prayer for the United States in particular. The second thought that Jeremiah's letter brings to mind is this. We should be on our guard against fake news and aware of the damage that it can cause. The false prophets of today masquerade as news feeds. At an early stage of this pandemic, one of my family told me that, as a fact, that the coronavirus had originated from a biological warfare laboratory in Wuhan and not the meat market, as was being alleged. I was shocked. I'd not heard that. I was surprised and I decided to research it. It didn't take long to find an article in the New Scientist that made it very clear that the virus could not have been manufactured in a laboratory. And yet there are people who, for their own ulterior motives and vested interests, continue to assert that it was. Some Chinese claim that the virus actually came from America. Some Americans claim that the whole thing is a big hoax. And so it goes on. Fake news and misinformation can be dangerous. The internet and social media are awash with it. It is our responsibilities, if we value truth, to ensure we get information from reliable sources and to be careful what we pass on. This is particularly important when the presidents of some countries are mavericks who make up the news as they go along and state as facts whatever they want to be true. We must be on our guard against fake news. The third thought is that the end is in sight. Whether or not it comes as quickly as we hope it might, if vaccine development goes well. 
70 years must have sounded a long time to the captives in Babylon when they read Jeremiah's letter. But it may have been good for them to hear it. It meant that they could get on with their lives rather than wallowing in their misfortune and being obsessed with bringing an end to something over which they had no control. There are those who want us to believe that our economy and society can just bounce back from this and soon everything will be back to normal. It is healthier to be realistic than to have false hopes. The nature of the virus is such that we cannot know how long this pandemic and its effects will last. We can usefully pray for those carrying out clinical trials on potential vaccines and remedies. The fourth thought is that God has plans for us and they are plans for our good to give us hope for the future. Verse 11 is a promise of God that Christians often quote and rightly so. We believe that God does have plans for us and that his plans will always benefit us. But when these words are taken out of context, they can easily be turned into a candy coated gospel, to quote the title of a song by the Fisher folk that I used to listen to in the 70s, and especially where the word prosperity appears. Remember that God's immediate plan for the exile was that they would remain in exile for another 50 years or so. The promise to their nation that God would bring them back from captivity, which we read in verse 14, would for some of them only be fulfilled in the lives of their children or grandchildren. God's plan for us may not be prosperity in terms of wealth. He may be calling us to a simpler lifestyle. With the world's human population increasing, it may be that coronavirus has had the fortunate side effect of showing us that we can reduce rather than increase our consumption of the Earth's resources and still thrive. It's unlikely that God plans to magic away all our problems. More likely, God will give us the strength, character and resilience to face a difficult future, perhaps in terms of health, and perhaps financially. And the fifth thought prompted by Jeremiah's letter is this. If we seek God with all our heart, we will find him. At times, God may feel distant, especially when we are isolated or if we fall sick. Jeremiah's letter reassures us in verses 13 and 14 that God's, God does not play hide and seek with us. God desires to be found. And we know that even better than Jeremiah did because God revealed himself to the world in Jesus. We're looking in this sermon series at passages from the Old Testament. If we seek God with all our heart, and especially if we immerse ourselves in the story of Jesus in the New Testament, there we will surely find him. To encourage you in that, let me quote from a letter written to another group of Jewish people about 650 years after Jeremiah wrote to the exiles. I'm referring to the New Testament letter we call the letter to the Hebrews. It begins, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, people like Jeremiah, at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, Jesus, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son, that Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. To the Babylonian exiles, God said through Jeremiah, you will seek me and find me 
when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you. In Jesus, God has made himself easier to find. I pray that you may find him and that he may find you in these difficult days. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Emmanuel Croydon podcast. For more information about our church and everything we have going on, visit our website, emmanuelcroydon.org.uk. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram to see and hear what's going on in the life of our church. God bless you and have a wonderful week. Thank you.